I think I'm mic'd up. First of all, it's a, a great pleasure to be here. There is something slightly surreal about discussing India in this uh, particular environment, uh, um, uh, in, this frozen, uh, in this frozen little place. It's, a, it's, a, it's a slightly disorienting. Let me just put a bit of background. First of all, it is true that uh, uh, I have a, a, I was a long-standing outsider's interest in India. Um, as I always say when I'm on a panel with Montek, uh, Montek was my first boss uh, at, uh, when I joined the World Bank in 1971. We worked together, so we've been friends for 40 years, um, which is slightly frightening thought. And uh, for a substantial period in the 1970s, I was the World Bank's senior divisional economist on India. Uh, and at that stage, of course, India was unimaginably different from today. This was really the worst decade in India's uh, post-independence economic performance uh, and uh, the 70s and wh where we are now would have seemed pretty well inconceivable. Though I have to say that I was one of those constantly arguing at the time that this was what has happened was perfectly possible for India. I was, a, I was always a, a growth optimist about India and I'm very glad to have been vindicated. Now, we know that over the last 20 years, um, 20, 30 years, the growth rate of India has gone up from the so-called Hindu rate of growth, a term coined by our friend Raj Krishna, of about 3% to first 6 or 7%, and more recently, over 8%. So the question is whether it will go further. There are some peculiarities, just mentioned very briefly, which we need to touch on. <coughs> India's growth pattern is unique, as far as I can see. Um, everything about India is, of course, unique. Uh, uh, is, one has to say at the beginning. But um, in size, of course, it is only comparable with China. Uh, a diversity probably far greater. It is an extraordinary civilization and country. Um, but the, the economic uniqueness is this is a country in which services, this has not been an industrialization-led growth. It's very different from the pattern of growth that we've seen in East Asia. To me, it's always been rather surprising and difficult to understand. And I've always assumed that at some stage, India will have to industrialize like other rapidly growing countries. Nonetheless, it has grown very rapidly. It is also important to remember that India is still very poor despite this growth at purchasing power parity. India's GDP per head is somewhere around 8% on the latest figures, 8% of US levels. There is one, at least one remarkable achievement recently, which is the rise of the savings rate to about 35% of GDP. Absolutely phenomenal and particularly interesting because it's overwhelmingly household savings. And uh, but we all know there are very many obstacles. So we're going to discuss those in a little moment. Um, let me just start by introducing the panel very briefly to discuss these issues. Um, to my left is Monte Kalawalia, who is, of course, the Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission of India. For those who don't know, uh, the Chairman of the Planning Commission is and always has been the Prime Minister. To his uh, uh, left is Mr. O.P. Bhatt, who's Chairman of the State Bank of India, which is the biggest bank in India. Um, to his left is another uh, friend of mine, not quite 40 years, but uh, we've known each other since I think you went to the IMF as Chief Economist. Very, very distinguished uh, economist indeed. His, his feet in both countries. He lives and of course teaches in, uh, in America, Chicago, Raghuram Rajan. To his uh, left is Mr. Uh, uh, Prashant uh, Ruya. Um, who is the group chief executive of the SR Group, a uh, uh, huge conglomerate uh, in many businesses, including telecommunications. Uh, to your left, and I'm very grateful to her, is Beth Comstock from GE, uh, your head of marketing, I, I think. Um, and finally, to his left is Doug McMillan, who's president and CEO of Walmart International. So uh, let me start with you, Montek. From the government's point of view, what do you see as the challenges and what are you actually going to do 
uh, in the rest of this term um, to meet the challenges of raising growth further, or do you, in fact, still regard that as a priority? Well, <clears throat> somewhere, I'm not sure if I'm right, but somewhere I read a, a description of this event as uh, what does India have to do to grow faster than China? That is correct. That's not actually the way we look at things. We're trying to do the best we can. I think the best we can, we think, is somewhere between 9 and 10 percent. You and other experts tell us that China is going to slow down and that it's actually good for them to slow down. If that happens, it's quite possible that if we achieve what we want and if China does what you think is inevitable, India might grow a little faster than China. I mean, it'll take a very long time to catch up with China in terms of size of GDP and per capita income. So now very briefly, uh, I think a relevant one issue is that we've done well. I mean, as you yourself said, growth was 9% or so for four years, slowed down during the recession, come back rather smartly, 85 now, 10-year growth rate 7.7%. So one view would be, uh, you know, India's accelerating. The acceleration is going to continue, and so we're bound to hit 9%. I think this would be a great mistake. I mean, that is not our view. I think you have to look at the question, uh, will India continue to grow rapidly? And I don't think it's automatic, but I do believe that if we, if we uh, play it right and have the right set of both macro and micro policies, uh, there are many things working in favor of India. High savings rate, very dynamic private sector, very diversified. Lots of new entrants into it, uh, willingness to compete, uh, openness to the world much greater than before, and I think an improving educational and skill level. But in all of this, there's lots more to go in the sense that in terms of uh, education and skill levels, India has, if you like, unexploited potential, which actually means we are below what we ought to be. And But, but I mean, that's also an opportunity in the sense that if the dynamic, if the momentum is there, and if Indian policy uh, tightens up its own effort and increases it in the area of education and skill development, on the supply side, that's a very important positive factor. Obviously, there are, there's macroeconomics. I mean, I think we've generally been regarded as being macroeconomically a well-managed country, uh, probably tend to have higher fiscal deficits than people are comfortable with. But we're very aware that we need to reduce this fiscal deficit. And the current policies of the government are very firmly anchored on that assumption that the, the reduction in the fiscal deficit that occurred up to 2008, that got reversed during a period when stimulus policies were fashionable, now has to continue to go down again. I think it will, they, we will show in the current year, we will show that the fiscal deficit is on target, better than it was a year ago. And I think the finance minister, when he unveils his budget, will, will show a further reduction in the fiscal debt. So macro, reasonably good. I think in India, politics pays more attention to inflation than on virtually anything else. Inflationary pressures are up. It's a major political issue. The single most important thing that India needs to do is to get its infrastructure act together. And we have a very uh, well-defined uh, program for expanding investment in infrastructure. It depends much more than in the past on private sector participation. Uh, I mean, very roughly, we expect in the next five-year period, beginning 2012, uh, we expect that 50% uh, of the investment that occurs in the infrastructure sectors should come from what we call public-private partnership. That compares with uh, 30 plus percent in the preceding five years and 10 percent in the five years before that. So there's been a trend increase in uh, the reliance on the private sector to build infrastructure. And so far it's been good, uh, but what we're now expecting is really a very ambitious uh, turnaround. India is well behind the curve in the sense that uh, I think our infrastructure was chugging along at a pace that maybe made sense for a 6 percent growth rate. It's simply not up to supporting 8 to 9 percent growth, so we really have to do a lot. So I think I would put that very high. If you looked at Indian policy almost at any time in the last 15 years, you would have said there's more noise than action, and that the government appears. A lot of noise which will distract people, and I think investors should 
as it were, separate the noise to signal ratio, which in India is higher than it should be. But the signal is very strong also. Mr. Bhatt, what is your comment on where we are now in India and, uh, and how uh, far you go along with this presentation of where it's got to? What is important for India today is that the growth that is taking place, 8, 8.5%, 9%, we have to look at it in two ways. A, whether it is sustainable indefinitely. The kind of resources that we'll be consuming and the kind of waste that we'll be creating, and if India's 1 billion people are going to do that, and China's another 1 billion people are going to do that, and in the next, say, about 20, 30 years, there'll be about 3 billion. The amount of resources that these people would then need to consume to maintain this rate of growth in, in, in some ways or in many ways, I think is not there. And the second question, again, with regard to India is this inclusiveness. In India, the Gini coefficient is not a very good uh, thing at the moment. There are rich people who are getting extremely richer, and there are poor people who, at least in relative terms, are getting poorer. So they may be earning more rupees, but I think they still have, you know, one square meal a day or half a square meal a day. So when India grows at 8%, everybody is not growing at 8%. There are some who are growing at 20, 50, 100%. There are some which are growing at less than 8%. And in relative terms, there are some which are getting poorer. And therefore, certain quick actions that should be taken about this is, one is with regard to agriculture. You know, food scarcity is going to become a nightmare. There are statistics which say that the food grain availability in India today per capita is less than at the time of the Bengal famine. So in agriculture, what we need to do is improve productivity. And it may not be too difficult in India because in India, the rates of agricultural productivity vary from state to state and is as low as 2% to as high as 11%. So even if you could just bring up the productivity across the country to whatever is the highest, that might just do the trick for the next few years. And the other thing is that there is a huge amount of waste of agricultural produce in India. I think this is something which needs to be done very urgently. The second thing is, and I think Montek touched upon it very briefly, is that, you know, we in China there was some kind of a demographic dividend. And we see in India also today there is some kind of a demographic dividend. But if there are not enough jobs across the country, everybody cannot be in the financial services sector or in the IT sector. And if these people are not educated for the kind of jobs that would be made available. So not only we need education, we need a kind of education which will equip these people, which will actually make these people want to stay where they are. So some kind of you know practical, relevant education. So, so that is the other thing that I think is extremely important today. Uh, coming from bank, one of the most important things that I feel is that India has to sustain 8 or 9 percent growth rate. In, in the kind of way today's economies operate, no economy can grow at that rate without a good banking system. Now, while we have a good banking system, it's not great. And while we may be having some banks which are close to great, like State Bank of India, we <laughs> sure. <laughs> But definitely we do not have the kind of size and scale that is required to sustain this kind of growth. We require banks which are two, three, four, five times bigger than this. And the kind of capital that we will require over the next five to ten years to bring Indian banks up to scale so that they can sustain the economy going forward at 8 percent could be something like 300,000 billion dollars or something like that. I mean, I mean that, that is a number which is unimaginable and that is a number which I do not know from where that money will come because as of now, you know, everybody seems to be having, you know, oil in the ears and not even thinking about it, at how, how, how we are going to capitalize our banks for growth. Thank you very much. I think I will turn to Raghu now because I think that works quite well. You know, f first, whenever you talk about India, you have to recognize that really, um, you know, while there are lots of good things going on about India, a lot of Indians focus on the downside. Uh, that's the natural part of the debate. Uh, and, and it's important to focus on those downsides because that's where we need change. We have a governance structure which was set up for the 19th century, literally. There are many laws on the books which were written in the 1800s and you know, 70s and 80s and are still governing uh, some of what we do. So that's, that's one important issue. Second, as Montek said, 